and welcome to The Rest is Politics Question Time with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And thanks for all the questions this week. Really appreciate the effort that you all go to sending them in. It it really does help us to work out what we want to talk about each week. And if you want to carry on the conversation around all things Rest is Politics, as we mentioned in the main podcast this week, we've set up an online trip chat room exclusively for the Rest is Politics Plus members on the website Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. You just get on there and you chat away about whatever you want, be it British politics, America, your favourite books, your favourite TV shows, what we've said, which one of us you like, which one of us you don't like, who you agree with, who you don't agree with. If you want to join in, you just head to therestispolitics.com. There'll be a link to the server in your welcome email. Right, Rory, first question. Will Stone, Zelensky's New Year speech was epic. How would Alistair and Rory rate it? And after 311 days, what would they do to help Ukraine conclude the war? What do you think about the speech first? Well, we were going to talk about this on the main podcast, but we got distracted into tea with Gordon Brown and Mo Molum and drugs and all sorts of other stuff. So apologies to those who wanted to hear about this on the main podcast. As I said on the main podcast, I thought Zelensky's New Year message was amongst the best pieces of communications I have ever seen. And to think of him doing that at a really difficult time. I don't know about you, Rory, but I always find New Year really, really difficult psychologically for some reason. I always have major plunges around this time of year. But to do that when he's just come back from Washington, he's just had another sort of, you know, massive hit in in relation to the way the war is developing. Um, And it was just, it was, look, it was 17 minutes long, which is a long time for one guy just to stand there and talk into a camera. There was a little bit of footage. There was film footage of some of the past. He told some of the story. What I loved about it was that he told the story and it wasn't really about him. It was about the Ukrainian people. And it was about what they were doing and why they were doing it. And he, he just, he, it was, it was like watching a kind of jigsaw puzzle of emotion and story. And lots of the other thing he did was it's only been 311 days. There were so many things that I'd forgotten that had happened and we've already forgotten them. And he was bringing them out there. And then when you got to the end of it, it was, you felt this, you did felt a sense, you felt a sense of hope. It was, it was incredible, wasn't it? And, and I think the thing that makes a speech partly is real clarity. And there's a sense in that, which we didn't see in any other politician's New Year messages. There's just one thing that he was talking about, which was victory. And he kept coming back to that. Yeah. And also the way in which a war leader, and he's a real war leader, can do things that no normal politician can do in terms of oratory. And it was a very beautifully constructed speech. He, he used a lot of that technique, which, which Neil Kinnock loves, the tricolon, where you, we put three phrases together. So he'd mm. talk about warriors to their homes, captives to their houses, IDPs to Ukraine, or he'd say, this is why each of us is here, why I'm here, why you are here. He also did, he also did that thing that I, I actually really like in a speech, but Tony Blair never, never really went for this much, but is when you tell stories and often you just have one word in a sentence. So he did the thing about, he was telling a story about, I can't remember the, the, the child's name, but he just said, you know, said the name, then he said, baby, bomb, died. You know, he just sort of had this, it was almost like he was going from rat-a-tat and then slight change of tone. We said in the podcast just before New Year, you know, about there was some criticism of his wearing his fatigues at uh, when he went to speak in Congress. But it, having that trademark look... And he had that, I don't know if you noticed the sort of setting of it, the sort of, the flag was there, but it was very vague. It was actually quite a dark setting. Yeah. Was, was he not outdoors? Was he not outdoors? Definitely, it was outdoors and it was freezing cold and he just sort of yeah. stood yeah. there and he just kind of, and I, I guess it must have been scripted. There must have been an auto cue, but maybe not because there was a very natural communication. Well, but, but there were definitely elements that were beautifully written, which he mm. must have either memorized or, or auto cued. But, uh, but I, I, th- I thought it was extraordinary. P- did you see Putin's yeah, speech? Yeah, I did see Putin's speech. Putin, as usual, manages to, every speech he gives, gives the impression he's standing in front of a blue screen and, and that there's a sort of some weird virtual reality thing. I mean, there were people behind him moving. They were military, weren't they? Yeah, except for one lady who, Clarissa Ward, who's the CNN international correspondent, has picked up, appears in almost every image with Putin. She appeared in that image. She appears with an image of him on a boat. She appears with him in church. So there was a lot of discussion on Twitter on whether she was a a bodyguard or an actor. But eventually they've decided she's a woman called Svetlana Radchenko, who's his junior environment minister 
who for some astonishing reason he puts in every single shot that he appears in. But she was, you're right, in a military uniform. Well, I, do you think there might be something going on there that I don't even know who the current Mrs. Putin is, but whether there might be something she should object well, to there's there. something very peculiar going on there. Um, and it was an odd speech. I mean, of course, in, in its way, it did the business for his audience. Uh, and what he does, like many, many extreme nationalist leaders, is this extreme clarification, black and white. Mm. So he, he said in his speech, this year clarified things. It clarified the difference between heroism and cowardice. It revealed through the difficult situation in Donbass that the West that had been pretending to try to resolve it had actually secretly all along been plotting with the neo-Nazis to do these war crimes. Mm. So in its way, I think it did its business. But of course, he looked very, very stiff compared to Zelensky. I mean, you really felt Zelensky vindicated being outdoors and his mm. combat fatigues. Putin looks elderly. His face looks over Botoxed. I'm saying all this because the Russians obviously have banned me from ever going to Russia again, which makes me a little bit bitter. <laughs> And by the way, I got a, a question from somebody called Samantha Powell. Why she said you often talk about things that the, the mainstream media don't give sufficient coverage to. Why has there been so little coverage of the comments by Sir Geoffrey Nice? And this is that you know who Geoffrey Nice is. He's the guy who led the prosecution of Milosevic, and he did an interview on the on the BBC setting out why Putin should be should go on trial for war crimes committed in Ukraine which I did think was quite a big... This, this is a guy who knows the Geneva Convention and knows the rules of war inside out and who was giving a pretty compelling case that Putin should go on trial for war crimes. That's fantastic. And it's a surprise that, that people aren't talking about this more openly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I guess, I guess for, for people like Macron who are trying to find a route out for Putin, they'd be reluctant politically to go down that route, wouldn't they? Well, on that, Rory, I wasn't going to raise it, but I'm now going to raise it because I did have a few little messages from some of my French friends, can I put it like that, who felt that you'd been a bit harsh on Macron, although you did say he was your politician, foreign politician of the year, but they felt that you were caricaturing his position on Ukraine, that it is not a sort of black and white, as you think, of Biden thinking it's got to be all at war to the end and Macron thinking there has to be negotiation. And one of these people, Sophie Pedder, who's the bureau chief in Paris of The Economist, she sent me a message saying, get Rory to take a look at the Ukrainian defense minister's response to Macron's New Year address. Uh, and the defense minister is called Andrei Zogorodunyik. And he says, kudos to Macron. His post in Ukrainian language, link below, where he says France and Europe will be supporting us till victory is a very strategic statement as the Western allies join us in, in anticipation the war must end with victory. Uh, we are this good, good, well, well done, Sophie Petta. Well, we look forward to reading more of her stuff. Okay, question for you. Hugh Walker, as Israel shifts violently to the right, you continually avoid any discussion of it. Why? And just to give you some time to think about your answer, just for listeners to bring them up to date on that. What's happened, of course, is that Bibi Netanyahu is coming back in, and he's coming back in with a very, very odd coalition, including some extremely unfortunate figures who've made unbelievably unpleasant and threatening remarks, including about retaking the West Bank and others. Mm. So wh why don't we talk more about Israel? I guess because, look, well, we have talked about it. The first thing to say is we have talked about Israel, and we've talked about Netanyahu and his comeback. And I think I told a story not long ago about John Holmes Tony Blair's former foreign affairs advisor saying in 1997, Netanyahu was a 24 carat bullshitter. Um, and we have talked about it. What, but I think what's happened is that we're back to the point about when things are not high up the actual political agenda. So, of course, a new Israeli election is newsworthy. Netanyahu coming back is newsworthy. But has it moved the dial on the Middle East peace process? Insofar as it has, it's, prob it's moved it backwards. And that just the, the then just becomes a danger that, well, what do we keep saying other than the fact that we, you, you and I, I'm sure are in pretty much the same place. We believe in a, a two-state solution. We think that the Americans have got a key role to play. They are trying to play that role, but it becomes very, very difficult when you have this coalition put together. So what are we going to say about Israel other than what you've already just said, which is that Netanyahu is a pretty bad guy. He's done a lot of bad things. And he's now surrounded by really bad guys who've said and done a lot of really, really bad things. Yeah. I mean, I think that the people, that, and again, I mean, if I'm getting pushback on Macron, I'll definitely get an enormous amount of pushback from, from friends of mine on this. But 
part of the trouble seems to be the religious Zionism party, which is led by a man called Bezalel Smotrich, which is very, very ultra-nationalist. He's the finance minister now, isn't he? I'm sure people are going to push back and, and um, come back on us on this too. He said, by the way, Roy, just, just, and again, maybe we should, because we did talk a little bit about God in our last episode of 2022. So they now have, as the deputy minister in the prime minister's office, they've got somebody who is avowedly homophobic. Uh, that's Abby Maus. They've got this guy that you talk, you, you've just mentioned, who's now the finance minister, whose, whose big slogan is that it's time for Israel to try obeying God's commandments as an economic approach. Um, how is that one going to work out? So I don't quite know. I, whoever asks us that question, what do they want us to talk about, Israel, other than what we've said many, many times, which is that it's deeply concerning. It's really hard to see how it's going to get resolved, but it only gets resolved if the international community, and particularly the Americans, stay absolutely fixated on trying to get it resolved. And re-engage, because there is a sense that, that as I think we've talked about in the past, that over the last 20, 30 years, the attention of the world has very much moved away from Israel-Palestine, that increasingly the Gulf, which was a sort of backwater 40 years ago, now Saudi and UAE are very much front and center. And the cultural centers, the Arab world, which were you know Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, Palestine, have very much been marginalized from the Arab Spring onwards. Abraham Accords meant that Israel's now created all these new economic links. So I, I think there is a sense in which people are, are no longer really engaged. Yeah. We, well, I think they're engaged, but I think that it's very hard to know how you get it to the point in the international agenda where you can actually start to make change. Particularly now you've got an Israeli government that is going to be even more hardline than the ones that we've already got, you know, all too used to. Right. Right. Martin, here's one, Rory. Martin Fever Year. Ooh, yes. I'm assuming that's a real name as opposed to a prediction for 2023. Could you please explain the definition of populism? It's a term that you use all the time, but I don't understand it. I, what, do you want to have a go first? Yeah, can I have a go first? So um, the, the, the first thing I think about populism in its modern form is it involves presenting yourself as speaking for the people against the elite. But the yeah. people that you're speaking for is always called the real people. And it's not actual, it's not all the people, obviously. And often it's not even the majority of the people. It's a particular, often nationalist, nativist appeal to a section of the population that tries to represent themselves as though they're everybody and treat anyone who disagrees with them, minority groups and others, as though they are a feat out of touch, treacherous elites, and that gives them the legitimacy to challenge constitutions. Anyway, back to you. No, I, well, I, I would, I, I would agree with that. I think, it's, I think a classic definition is it's a form of politics whereby the view of uh, what the politician represents as the people is turned against what the politician represents as an, an out of touch elite. And even though the politician may be Trump, Johnson, as elitist as they come particularly with the help now of technology, they have the tools to make that effective as a political strategy. Now, here's one, Roy. You, th this, this is... Um, wait, wait, wait. Didn't just very quickly, there's, there's, there's a strange thing, because you just asked me a question from a man who was called, what was he called? Fever? Fever, yeah. Well, here's a question from someone called Jack Lefever. <laughs> so if China were to invade Taiwan, would there be a similar global reaction to Russia's invasions of Ukraine or markedly different? I, I, I agree it's slightly off topic, but the name, that's an interesting coincidence. So the, with the, our, question, our choice of questions is now being driven by the name of the person. Well, you've got to remember, we get a lot of complaints about why we don't so, for example, we've already had Why Don't You Talk About Israel. I've spotted three already recently. Why don't you? Haven't you talked about Venezuela? So I think that what we should say to people, just say that your name has something related to fever and we're bound to listen. And the answer to the question is I think the reaction will be even more dramatic. Well, By the way, Rory, I yeah, was... It'll be unbelievable because we've talked about, sorry, just very quickly, we've talked about semiconductor chips and the fact that 90% of the advanced semiconductor chips in the world are made in Taiwan and 50% of all, but 80% of the electric batteries in the world are made in China. I mean, one of the reasons why uh, it's tough for Keir Starmer and others to talk about green growth plans and investing in giga factories for batteries and things is that China has taken the march on that as it has on so much else. And mm, mm. sanctions and counter sanctions against China is going to have the most catastrophic impact on our economy, but I think we'll do it. But I think China and the rest of the world will suffer deeply. And what I think already is likely to be a prolonged recession will get much, much worse. Now, Rory, three, three quick points to make. The first yeah. is that somebody that we know up here in the Scottish Highlands 
yep. who's a very is a regular listener to the podcast, yep. said, "What on earth is Rory doing? Saying there's a forty percent chance." of this Chinese invasion of Taiwan happening and what does he base that on? And I'm going to give you a couple of little pointers that maybe you can help make him even more terrified. The first is that the Taiwan's president has rewritten the conscription rules in um, Taiwan, that all Taiwanese males who turn 18 next year are going to have to serve 12 months in the military rather than the present. Uh, I think the current system is four months. And the second thing is, I saw a report, I think it was in the Times, which was a discussion going on inside the UK government saying that Britain is very badly prepared for the possible economic consequences that would result from the Chinese invasion of Taiwan, that it would cripple supply chains, it would lead to COVID-style shortages of imports, um, and that industry's leaders need to think very, very hard about where they're going to get goods from. Yeah, it's, 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 it's terrible, isn't it? Because... Of course, that's true in Britain. It's true right the way across Europe and the United States. And the problem is that ensuring yourself against that, having the resilience to deal with losing your supply chain from China is incredibly expensive. I mean, it would involve incredible investments in setting up alternative supply chains. Why do I think 40%? Well, as we've discussed in the past, and there's a couple of good recent biographies of Xi Jinping. You, you promoted a really good German one. There's, there's also a, another good English language one, which is quite a scholarly biography. But in both cases, they make it very, very clear that the issue of Taiwan has been central to Xi Jinping's political identity almost from the beginning of his time. And it's, it's very, very likely that he will see unifying China or bringing, bringing Taiwan into China as being the legacy he wants. And the, it's just a question of time. There are two things in balance, which is why we're at 40%, not 60%, which is balancing the fact that he hasn't quite got the Chinese military and Navy where he wants it to be, to absolutely guarantee an easy victory in Taiwan. Mm. But that has to be weighed against the fact that if I were he, I would think this is quite a good moment to move because it's a moment where the West is already thrown off balance by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So it cuts both ways. I do think the response that Britain, Europe, the United States have brought to Ukraine has been an important deterrent against Xi Jinping's actions. But it also will suggest to him that we are economically in a very difficult situation and it will be quite difficult, he will feel, to say to our voters who are already facing this unbelievable inflation and energy costs that we're going to take sanctions and counter sanctions over Taiwan, which would be mm. 10, 20 times worse than anything we've seen to date. All right, Roy, let's go for a break. Welcome back to the Rest is Politics Question Time. Now, bring it home again. Uh, this goes back to something we discussed last time, and I want to revisit this because I don't, I, don't I, I don't think I said what I really think. Okay. News 23 slash 5. In a recent episode, Rory was passionate about maintaining the UK's green belt in relation to constructing new homes, yet he never seems to stop traveling, especially flying. How does he balance this position with his carbon footprint? Lucian Lawrence, R Rory said he wants to protect the green belt from housing and build higher in London to reduce housing scarcity. How does he propose to do the latter with such resistance to new development in both law and local nimbyism? And I, if you remember, Rory, last time you, you I didn't realize that that had been asked, the question about the green belt. And I said I was broadly in favor. I don't think, I, th I think I'd said that because I was just sort of thinking aloud. I actually don't see how we are. I think the green belt risks becoming a kind of totem that there has to be, I agree with you, there should be a broader environmental strategy, environmental policy, but we are going to have to build more homes and we are going to have to build them in places where currently we don't build. Um, and I think we cannot forever uh, just say that because we've got this green belt thing, it's like some sort of sacrosanct totem that we can no, no, we can never touch in the future. Ha. Huh. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm, it's good, good. We've brought, I'm on the other side of this because I think if you give up on the green belts, not just in London, but around our other cities, you will create exactly the kind of urban sprawl that you see in the United States. Mm. And we're not a large enough country to accommodate that. It will, you can see so many parts of our country that are now really wrecked. And I think at a time when nature and biodiversity is under huge threat in Britain, it would be horrible to build over the Green Belt. And I think there's such potential to make it a much more biodiverse landscape. And I do think the real problem in London is our obsession on building you know, low two-story houses, which sprawl all the way out, metro land, all the way out through West London. And I think 
freeing up planning, a brave government that freed up planning that would allow people to double the size of their houses, put a flat on top and rent it out. And, and go down below? And go down below. But I think going up is the easiest thing and can be done very easily. And there's some very good examples of it already happening in London. Mm. Did you see, did you see um, the, the, in, in Tokyo, the, the, the Japanese now are paying people to leave Tokyo? Ah, very interesting. Do you, think, do you think we might have to move eventually to a kind of new generation of, of Milton Keynes type? Uh, developments. Well, I definitely, definitely Milton Keynes was, was actually in a way a real success. And I think building really ambitious new towns is a way of dealing with it. And thinking about what I would call gentle density, which is building at six, seven stories, which is, of course, what makes the beauty of Paris, is a very well, good way of thinking about it. Not mm. 40, 50 stories, which actually in UK law, you need to have so much standoff around the base of them that they're not really worth doing, mm. but going for the gentle density. Question for you, Chris Cartledge. Why don't we have ministers with more industrial backgrounds? E.g., surely the Minister for Transport should have some experience managing transport infrastructure. Same for <laughs> other minister roles, question mark. Uh, but I think we're back to the thing about, you know, why don't, why don't people from a far broader network and gene pool go into politics? I mean, I'm always struck when I do events with business, some of which I did with you last year, uh, where when you get into sort of people asking questions, they will, there's always a question about, you know, why have, does the quality of politicians seem to have fallen? Why have so few people who've from this background, that ba background got into politics? And it's easy to blame politics as some kind of abstract. But I always say to these people, well, have any of you ever thought of going into politics? And, you know, sort of there's lots of uncomfortable shuffling in their seats. And occasionally somebody might put their hand up and say, well, I did think about it, but I didn't like the intrusion into my life or whatever it might be. So, you know, I, I don't think it's impossible for people. Look, it's, hard, it's still hard to get into politics and that more people want to be MPs than there are places by a long, long chalk. But I think that one of the, you know, whoever's asking that question is right on one level that it'd be good if we had people from a, a far broader range of professional backgrounds. But we're only going to get that if people from those backgrounds say, I am going to go in and make a difference. Well, the, the other solution, of course, which I favour is, is the much more radical one, which is to say that the problem is that you're dragging your ministers out of this very limited pool. So, yeah. you know, the recent governments have had about 300, 320 MPs, of which they're trying to find 100 ministers. And most of these people on both sides are professional politicians who know very little about the rest of the world because they've been local councillors and they've been local party members since university. And frankly, people with other kinds of jobs don't don't really go into politics. So the answer, of course, is to go to more of a US system where you can appoint a cabinet that doesn't come from your MPs. I mean, I was always struck that when we had Philip Hammond and Michael Fallon and Gavin Williamson as defense secretaries, and these were people who'd taken zero interest in defense before they became defense secretaries. I mean, they were people who I remember joking that they didn't know the difference between a, a javelin and a tomahawk. Mm. Uh, and up against yeah, I know them, the difference. There, there, isn't a, there isn't an event in the Olympics for the tomahawk. There we are. Beautiful. On the other side, you've got the US where they were sitting opposite Ash Carter, who was a de defense academic, or General Maitlis, who'd been the head of the US Marine Corps. You know, it's a very, very different situation. It's sort of unthinkable in the US system. Yeah, yeah but Rory, you're, you're, argue, you're arguing for a totally different political system then, because, you know, I don't think you can envisage a situation where you have an elected prime minister who then appoints cabinet ministers from wherever he or she wants and sticks them in the House of Lords, which is now, I think, so discredited as a political institution. Well, anyway. That's what Gordon Brown did, isn't it? I mean, he, that was his government of all talents. He tried to do that, didn't he? No, no, well, there were one or two ministers, Adam West, the, the naval guy, and you can see why there's a case for that. But Ma if you Mark they, Mallet Brown in the Foreign Office, yeah, but they weren't, Peter they Mandelson. Weren't cabinet, they weren't cabinet Peter, ministers. Peter Mandelson, Peter. he put in the cabinet, put him in the Lords to get him in the cabinet. That's true. That's true. But so, so, the, but I'd say that was an exception, not a rule. You're, you're sort of saying the prime minister should have even more power to decide who they want around that, that table and, and less accountability to parliament. Well, I'd, I'd, want a, I'd want something much more. I'd want a separation between the legislature and the executive. Yes, yeah, so you, are, you are arguing for a completely different political system. Yeah, 100%. Now, what about, what about um, this one? Hot buzz. As Scotland would have celebrated 50 years in the EEC EU today, uh, this is when the question was sent in, and many of their employee rights are about to go on a potential bonfire. Do you feel any empathy at all for those Scots who may now want a different future for themselves and their country because of Brexit? P.S. Happy New Year. 
Yes, I, I, I do have sympathy. I, I remain very, I mean, I think two, two quick things. One is, I think Scotland would have a tough time joining the European Union. And most of its trading relationships are, of course, within the United Kingdom. And it would then find itself facing significant barriers trading with its biggest trading partner if it suddenly joined the EU Single Markets and Customs Union, because it would find itself in some version of the situation which Germany now finds itself in, where German-UK trade has collapsed over the last few years. I also think that, as we've talked about when we discussed Kosovo and Montenegro joining the European Union, um, there are many countries in the European Union that are very, very unwilling to allow in countries that are separated from other countries, because if you're Spain, or, or indeed the four other countries that are currently blocking Montenegrin accession, they have strong internal reasons not to favour nationalisms mm. in their own countries. By the way, did you see that the border was shut briefly in uh, Kosovo, Serbia? Yeah, very good. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. It's, and, and, and that that's a prediction, I think, that sadly may, may prove right, that the, the chance of a conflict again on the European conflict. Oh, I've triggered, I've triggered Rory into predicting another war. That's it. I like predict wars. Dilly dally. You know, this links this. Make a controversial political prediction for 2023 and each suggest a forfeit for the other if they get it wrong. Uh, I don't know if this is controversial, but a political prediction I will make, I can already see the beginnings of it in the client journalists who are basically in the pocket of the the, the worst prime minister in history, the, the blonde one, or well, the blonde male one. And that is that Johnson will try to effect some sort of comeback. But I, th I, I hope, this is, this is maybe wishful thinking, but I, if there is any real respect for truth and parliamentary sovereignty that he claims to believe in, then I hope he will be thwarted by the current, I believe, still ongoing inquiry into whether he lied to Parliament um, and that his career will be ended by that. Okay. Here's my political prediction. I think the Republican Party in Congress is going to tear itself to shreds. There's a really interesting thing happening at the moment with the election of the Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, where he's basically being blocked by five or six extreme right-wing Republicans. He's falling over backwards to try to pander to them, including saying he's going to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary and set up new committees to overturn everything that was done to investigate January 6th. He's got Trump calling for him, and he still can't win them over. And mm. it reminds me a lot of the way in which the right wing of the Tory party took over and destroyed any attempts by Theresa May to get a compromise on Brexit. Because one of the elements of it is that the right of these parties seems to hold the whip hand by refusing to compromise. And you find yourself in a very odd situation, which is, had the Democrats been willing to come across and actually a few moderate Democrats vote for him, they could have marginalized this right-wing group. But of course, the Democrats are never going to do that. And the Republican Party will be dragged ever further to the right. Now, Rory, we did say that part of the question which you're avoiding was what are the forfeits if you're wrong? Uh, I'm going to suggest that if you're proved to be wrong, yep. uh, what, what, what's the time limit? You, this is your prediction for this year, yeah? My, this year, yeah. Yep. Okay, I'm going to suggest that the forfeit for you should be that at the, at the live event that we do closest to that time when this year ends, yep. you have to end it playing the bagpipes, not me. Oh jeez! Wow. Okay, that's very tough. All right. Okay. So that's a that's a good that's a good incentive for you to do a bit of practice. That really blind blind me. That's a big incentive to do a lot of practice. Wow. Um, okay. Forfeit for you. Um, if you are proven to be wrong, you have to go and give a speech at Eton. Oh. Well, I've been asked to do a speech at Eton many times, and maybe the new head teacher. Or is it, do we still call him a headmaster? Headmaster. headmaster, headmaster the headmaster. Yeah. Who, by the way, we're having on as a guest on the podcast one day. We are, Rory. I'm telling you that now. We're doing it. <laughs> um, maybe we could do it. Maybe we could do that at Eton in front of all the boys. Yep. Well, there we are. That's a possibility. But, but that's, your, that's, that's your forfeit. I was, I was hoping you were going to make me swim in the cold water and... Would you rather do that than play the bagpipes? I'd much rather do that. Would you? Okay. Now, the, the, the thing I was, uh, the point I was going to make is that the last time that I was invited to go and speak to Eaton, I said, I will do it as long as I can bring, <laughs> I can bring a TV crew with me. Ah. And they said, oh, we, let's just, let's just no, put, no, it, no, put it on hold for now. Put, put it on hold for now. Good. All right. Well, Alistair, thank you very much. It's been a jolly, jolly 50th birthday party. Thank Good. you. Good. Well, listen, Rory, as it is your birthday, the, the other yes. thing, I, I, as I am up in Scotland, we've got a lot of questions about, because I tweeted um, going to see Charles Kennedy's grave and playing the bag. I always yep. go every year we're up there and play the lament that was played at his funeral. Yep. 
and it had a it, it gets a, you always talk about you know twitter being a horrible place and and often it is but this year i had like i don't know it's up to a million views and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nice comments and people remembering charles and and so forth so it's not always horrible and i think that's because it's music and the other thing i'm planning for this year already yep i plan to i plan to try to to get you to become generally more musical. My musical highlight of the year so far, yesterday, we have a friend of ours, Catherine McLeod, who you may know was a journalist and, and she worked for Alistair Darling. And we went to, she was up staying with us and we went to see um, uh, some of her friends yesterday. And two of them, uh, Megan and Ewan, they are in a very, very famous folk band called Braybach. And mm-hmm. I'm, they said that if I mentioned James Lindsay, their double bass player, he loves the podcast so much, he will probably have a heart attack. I don't want him to have a heart attack, but I want him to know that Megan and Ewan put on a special performance just for us yesterday. It was absolutely brilliant. And in that spirit, Rory, yeah. given the day that this is, if yeah. you just sit very tight, sit very, very tight, yeah. and I'll be back with you in a moment. Hold on. All right. Go on then. Sitting tight. How was that? It was really lovely, Alistair. Thank you very, very, very much. How do you think the drone sounded? Well, I, I see, this is the problem. I'm not properly musical. I, this is why I think I've got a weird relationship with you, rather like my father. My father was very musical and believed that I just wasn't making enough of an effort. But I, I genuinely think it's not just a question of effort. I think there's something wrong with my ear. I played the pipes at a New Year's Eve thing down in Ardgower, this little brewery called the Ard, Ardgower Ales. And I was the only person, you'd think the Scottish Highlands would be sort of crawling with people who play the bagpipes. I was the only one there who could play the bagpipes. They asked me to play and it was freezing, freezing cold. And the, the bagpipes, this sounds weird, but they hate changes in temperature. So the fact is, Roy, my drones were off there slightly because I didn't want to spend the, the requisite 15 minutes tuning them up just so as you could, <laughs> just you could sit there and wait for me to play Happy Birthday. But anyway, I hope you have a lovely birthday and uh, we'll speak again next week. Speak next week. Lots of love. <laughs> <laughs>